If you've spent any time on the internet, and increasingly off it, you may have come across white supremacist memes. What a phrase. What a world we live in. Every culture has its myths, and racists are a culture all their own. I use the word culture in both senses there. Today we look at some of these myths and talk about communication and truth. The comments underneath this one are going to be just great, I can tell. White supremacy as a general attitude has of course been around for centuries, but white supremacy as an explicit political program, a plan for organising populations using genocide, was distilled into its purest form to date by the Nazis. But it did not suddenly go away the day Hitler died, and now it's on the rise again, so it's important that we know how to deal with it. It's usually said that we shouldn't engage with white supremacists in dialogue, because that's what they want. They want white supremacy to be treated as just another political issue, rather than the necessary first step towards genocide. That's why the received wisdom is the way we should interact with white supremacists is like this. It's uh, Pepe's become kind of a symbol. Why? Well, two reasons. The historical reason is that treating white supremacy as just another political issue in the public sphere is a mistake that we in Europe have made before. White supremacists don't usually like bringing up the Holocaust as a point against them, they call it the argument ad Hitlerum, but as ContraPoints has already pointed out in their brilliant video on white nationalism, if we're talking about white supremacy and racial purity as ideas that are supposed to be guiding government policy, the Nazis, being the main people who actually took a crack at that, are pretty bloody relevant. The other reason, though, is a more philosophical one, and that's what I want to talk about today. Rather than talk about the ethics of punching white supremacists, I want to talk about how white supremacist speech works, so that you can identify it and deal with it. The first thing that we need to realise is that speaking, communicating, isn't just about the content of what is said. Speaking is an act, and sometimes the most important thing is what that act does. Take the phrase, I love you. If I say it sincerely, so assuming I'm not lying, then every time I say it, the content of the message is the same. I, the person speaking, have some feelings of love towards you, the person to whom I am speaking. But depending on the context and the way in which I say it, the action I perform might be very different. Any actor will tell you that there are infinite ways to play this line. I might say I love you as a reminder, as a promise, as a reassurance, as passive aggression, as a thank you. I love 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 you! See what I mean? Same content, different actions. The meaning stays the same, but what I am doing to the person hearing me changes. Let's say we have a case where a stalker is sending a message every 10 minutes to their victim. All the messages say, I love you. It would be pointless to defend the stalker on the grounds that they are entitled to be in love. Of course they are, but that's not the issue. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what the specific act of sending that message repeatedly does. To take a real-world example, you might have seen a few issues recently about university students not wanting certain speakers to come and talk on campus. When that happens, the students inevitably get told the speakers are entitled to their opinions, which is of course true, but that isn't the issue. Speaking at a university, or paying somebody to speak at a university, is a specific act, and the concern is over what that act will do. So let's take a look at some white supremacist myths and what they do. Myth number one, the Irish slaves. The myth is that the Irish were in fact the first slaves to be brought to the colonies, and it has been covered up that they were more numerous and worse treated than black slaves, all of which is false. White criminals and other undesirables were sent to the colonies, many of them were Irish as well, but they were sent as indentured servants. This is not just a semantic distinction, it's a completely different legal and material category. Indentured servants were employed temporarily with employment contracts, and when their contracts were up, they might expect a parcel of land at the end of it. They could still own property. Their children weren't automatically servants. When their contracts were up, they were free. 
Indentured servitude was horrendously unpleasant, and undoubtedly people were pushed into it, but where the servants felt that they had been kidnapped or tricked, or if they were being abused, they had some legal options to get their contracts nullified, as some in fact did. The situation for slaves was very different. They were slaves for life, as were their children. They themselves were owned, not just their labour. They were not legally persons and could be lawfully executed, and they had no methods of resistance except... <coughs> and when the slaves were freed, those that lived to the end of slavery, which most didn't, they obviously were not on equal footing to everybody else. Indentured servitude is not comparable to slavery. Links in the doobly-doo. The Irish slaves myth is so far removed from reality and so easily shown to be false, yet white supremacists keep bringing it up, which suggests that they aren't really putting across the idea that it's true, or at least not just doing that and not all the time. Like, if I said it's raining all the time, even when it's not raining at totally inappropriate moments, like you say, good morning, Ollie, and I say, oh, good, it's raining morning, you might start to wonder, wait, is he really talking about the weather? Or is he talking about something else there? I'm sure some people are suckered into sincerely believing it. Maybe you're one of those people. Maybe you just typed Irish slaves into YouTube to see whether or not it's true. In which case, hello, it isn't. Please see the reading in the description. So what does this myth do rather than communicate? Well, the historian Liam Hogan has found that many of the people who share the Irish slaves myth also share with it the idea that people of colour today are lazy, are whining about nothing, that they don't deserve reparations, that campaigns and protests for racial justice are completely misguided, and there we see what the myth does. It gives people an excuse to talk about the political views that they already have, to talk about who they think should have power. In particular, it gives them an excuse to spread racist stereotypes about black people being lazy or violent. There's also a version where the myth says that the white Irish were the first slaves, but they weren't suited to working in tropical conditions, and that's why black slaves were brought in. Not only is that historically false, but that version is a subtle way of telling you that black people are biologically suited to being slaves. Which is also false, because slave, or degenerate, untermensch, subhuman, whatever you want to call it, isn't a biological category, it's a political one. <laughs> the second myth we need to identify is the myth of white genocide. The myth is that the immigration of people of colour and interracial marriages are equivalent to the genocide of white people. Lots to unpack here. The first thing is that interracial relationships and the immigration of people of colour is not the same as genocide. That's a false equivalence. The second thing is, America and Canada are both founded on actual genocide committed by white people, as are many other countries, including mine. The money that paid for Britain's Industrial Revolution came in large part from the enslavement and genocide of indigenous Americans. And of course, slavery. Real slavery. The descendants of the victims are by and large yet to be compensated and in many cases are still being brutalised. So when white supremacists use this myth to talk about defending a white homeland, all of the so-called white homelands, even in Europe, were built in large part using wealth stolen from people who weren't white. The white genocide myth is basically the racist equivalent of the war on Christmas. It's completely false and the name is totally overblown. But again, what does this myth do rather than communicate? Well, sometimes it's used to argue that interracial relationships shouldn't be allowed, which is obviously a massive restriction of people of colour's freedoms. Sometimes it's used to argue that non-white immigration shouldn't be allowed, specifically Muslim immigration. But, note, never in a way that actually acknowledges the real causes of migration and displacement. Unsurprisingly, white supremacists aren't interested in thinking about the reasons why people leave their countries and migrate, because they aren't interested in thinking of people who don't meet their definition of whiteness as people with hopes and dreams and feelings and who can make rational decisions. And of course, the myth is also used to argue for the establishment of all white countries, though white supremacists are curiously silent on how that is to be accomplished. The record of the only time anyone in history has ever tried it might give us some clues. Some versions of it are also used to argue that women shouldn't be allowed to have abortions or careers, or that LGBT people shouldn't be allowed to exist, so that there are enough Aryan babies being made. And of course, if you follow it down the rabbit hole long enough, it's not long before people like the American Nazi Party start saying that the real reason this fictional genocide is occurring is because of Jewish people. So again, it gives racists an excuse 
to advance their racist political agendas. What's also interesting is that these myths aren't used to argue for the supremacy of white people per se, but for a particular view of whiteness. Jewish people, LGBT people, men who aren't racists, and often people with disabilities, they may be white, but according to the white supremacists, they are still undesirable. I'm not going to break down what whiteness is here, but ContraPoints goes into it very, very well. These myths are arguably propaganda. It's not just that they're false, it's that it's not really about whether they're true, it's about what they do. Propaganda gathers and retains the people who are willing to repeat it, the people who share the underlying political view about who should have power and who shouldn't. Political theorist Hannah Arendt says that the main function of propaganda is as a tool of organization. If you're the one who knows about the secret conspiracy, who knows the truth, who's taken the red pill, then you're in the club. It doesn't matter whether or not it's strictly true. What matters is that you say it, and your buddy says it, and the group says it, and all of a sudden, we're a political organization. We are now the people who say this thing. Foldable Ideas breaks down Nazi propaganda really, really well if you want to learn more about that. Traditionally in philosophy, it's thought to be good to interpret what somebody is saying as possibly true, but when it comes to propaganda, that instinct won't serve you well. And of course, the tricky thing about propaganda is that it doesn't come with a warning label. In general, if you're hearing somebody speak, or if you're offering someone a platform from which to speak, don't just think about the content of their opinions in the abstract, which they are of course entitled to. Think about what specific acts of speech are doing. <laughs> you can help me make more videos like this one at patreon.com slash philosophytube. I want to thank John the Licorice Guy and Replica Kill for helping me doctor the script. You can follow them at these Twitter handles, and don't forget to subscribe.